Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How's it going? Good evening, everyone. John, Charles, waiting for Bill, waiting for Jay. There's Jay. Just waiting for Bill. Nobody see anybody see Bill? I don't see him yet. Uh, I think he'll be here shortly. Hello, Megan. Okay, I have everyone now. That's great. We'll reconvene our meeting from last month, the October 14th board meeting. We are a few minutes late due to closed session just prior to this. That's two months in a row. We did not start on time, but it was both times due to closed session. Our summary of action on those two closed session items are no reportable action. But that brings us to the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, indivisible with, liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, may I entertain a motion to approve the agenda, please? So moved. Second. A motion by Jay Carlin and second by Director Jensen. Uh, Christy, roll call vote, please. Director Carlin? Aye. Director Grace? Aye. Director Jensen? Aye. Vice President Quinn? Aye. President Hahn? Aye. Motion carries five to zero. The agenda is approved. Item eight, public comments on not agenda items. Ms. McEwen, please. Okay, members of the public may address the board on matters not listed on this agenda. The board cannot take action on any item that is not on the agenda. The board or staff may briefly respond to statements made or questions posed, or may ask questions for clarification. These items may also be referred to staff or scheduled on a future agenda. There will be a separate opportunity for public comment for each item on the agenda. And are there any hands, hands raised? 
I have, yes, um, Fred Hicks. Mr. Hicks, welcome in. Fred, you're muted. There you go. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm traveling today, so I apologize if my dog barks. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, before the agenda gets addressed, this is the only opportunity I, I have to raise points of order. So I would like to raise two points of order before the agenda items are addressed. First point of order is regarding public comment on items other than action items listed on the meeting's agenda. I would like to point out that the, Browns Act, the Brown Act, section 54954.3 says, and I quote, Every agenda for regular meeting shall provide an opportunity for members of the public to directly address the legislative body on any item of interest to the public before or during the legislative body's consideration of the item, end quote. During three of the last CSD board meetings I have attended, the board has not heard or received public comments on discussion items or staff reports listed within the agenda. During the last board meeting, President Hahn indicated he usually does not take comments on discussion. At this point in the meeting, I had a raised hand and immediately emailed my comments on a 20-year capital improvement plan to both President Hahn and Ms. McEwen. These were ignored during the meeting, and some of the response I received from President Hahn after the meeting said that the board does not need to take public comments on discussion items, and he intends to continue this in the future. Furthermore, President Hahn stated that the board did not break any rules and that he did not want to continue debate on Rosenberg's rule of order or the Brown Act. At that time, I let the issue go, but I would like to state on record, as I stated in my opening statement, that the Brown Act, Section 54954.3, specifically allows for public input on listed agenda items of interest to the public and by only allowing public comments on action items or items not listed on the agenda, the Brown Act is currently not being followed as written. I would like to request that the board resume hearing public comments as allowed for by the Brown Act for all listed agenda items and as also stated in the opening statement Christy McEwen just read. I have one more point of order. I can continue or if you'd like to address this one, I can pause. Um, you have three minutes, so um, go ahead and just make all your statements. Second point of order I would like to raise is in regards to Assembly Bill 361. Assembly Bill 361 requires the public be able to comment in real time. By definition, real time is, and I quote, the actual time during which something takes place. While the current format of meetings does allow for a raised hand and is easier to manage from an administrative point, the public is unable to comment in real time and raise points of order as called for in Assembly Bill 361 and Rosenberg's rule of order. I would like to ask the board to try to find a better way and meeting format which allows for real time comments to be made by the public during the board meetings. If I would have been able to comment in real time, I could have addressed these during the previous three meetings rather than have to make point of order comments in opening comments um, where they're not really the design place. And that's what I have for the two points of order. That was it, Mr. Hicks? Those are my two points of order, yes. Thank you, sir, appreciate that. Uh, is there any other hands raised? Um, yes, uh, Jeeva. Chris Biebert, welcome in. Hello, thank you for that. Um, my uh, points of order on the same line with uh, what Mr. Hicks had just mentioned. Our last um, addendum 11A uh, council had written up that public comment opportunities in real time, a legislative body that meets remotely pursuant to AB 361 must allow members of the public to access a meeting be a call-in option or internet-based service option, and the agenda for the remote meeting must provide an opportunity for members of the public to directly address the body in real time. A legislative body cannot require public comments to be submitted in advance to the meeting, which I also want to verify that was not um, keeping people's comments from being made when I noticed um, there was a request for them to be in by five not a demand, just a request. 
And then the next bullet and the one that was provided by Davis said no action during disruptions or in the event of a disruption that prevents the local agency from broadcasting the remote meeting or in the event of a disruption within the local agency's control that prevents members of the public from offering public comments using the call-in option or internet-based options. AB 361 prohibits the legislative body from taking any further actions on items appearing on the agenda, on the meeting agenda until public access is restored. And I submit respectfully, and it's sent to email asking what the standing was for legal that with that discussion being interrupted at the last meeting with after this AB 361 was put out and voted on that it could continue or not when um, we were not allowed to make any more comments. And the district monitors, another comment in the discussion there, that previous one, is the district monitors attendance via teleconference as well as email conference on the website throughout each public meeting and provides access for public comments um, real time. Sometimes we lose our connection or speakers or we can't work and, and like um, Fred gave an example where he emailed it in. So um, I'm wondering is it being monitored real time? So anybody who sends an email in will have access and if we are going to be allowed to continue uh, making comments that have been very much appreciated through staff and other times. Um, and um, what recourse, because we were here, it says a legislative cannot require public comments to be submitted. Wait, I'm reading the wrong one, that they cannot continue until the public has been restored. And we were intentionally not allowed to continue. So that was my question there. Then the second point is- Diva, that should be three minutes. Thank you then. Diva, can you make that second point in like 15 seconds? You can't have three more minutes, but if you wanna make it real quick, go ahead. Sorry, I had the, a mute again. Yes, I would just request that um, our Bear Valley PD not have to um, report an average response time until he's allowed to get, you know, compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So I'd like that to be removed from the reporting because that is misleading. So thank you very much, Greg, for that opportunity. Appreciate it, Jeeva. Any other hands raised for public comment on non-agenda items? Christy? Uh, Fred Hicks has his hand raised again. Uh, one time, I'm sorry. Can I keep the meeting rolling? Anybody else? Uh, Kara Cooper, let me get you started here, Kara. Miss Cooper, welcome in. Oh, oh, sorry. Kara, you're muted. To the Whiting Center. Hello? Ahead, you need Kara. to start over, Kara. You were yeah, I'm sorry. Is there any way we can move the meetings from Zoom to maybe the Whiting Center gym to have the proper uh, six foot distancing? And maybe we can um, maybe start the meeting at 630 for uh, people that come home at, at six. Just an uh, idea. Anyway, that's all. Appreciate that, Ms. Cooper. Thank you for your comments. Any other hands raised? Christy? No. Consent calendar items. Back to you, Ms. McEwen. Consent items are considered routine and are intended to be acted upon in one motion without discussion. During this portion of the meeting, the consent calendar will be read aloud. Prior to approval, the president will give the board, staff, and public the opportunity to pull any item for discussion. The remaining calendar will be acted upon. Any pulled items will then be heard and acted upon individually. A, approve minutes of the October 14, 2021 regular board meeting. B, accept committee report for October 2021. C, accept quarterly investment report as of September 30, 2021. D, accept register of warrants for October 2021. Uh, board members, do we do any items you'd like to pull? Mr. Go uh, ahead, uh, Mr. Quinn, I had a question as well. I'd like to pull items uh, C and D, please. Okay, Director Grace. 
I had a question on the minutes of October 14th uh, on item 11B on the previous agenda. I did not see a motion maker and a second. Uh, this was for the DPAC uh, staffing for the main members of DPAC. I, did, I know there are two motions. Uh, so I just think there needs to be a call out for that. Okay, I can amend those. And that was my only comment, Mr. President. All right, thank you. So we won't pull item A, we'll make that change. We'll pull items C and B. Uh, members of the public, are there any items you wish to pull from the agenda or the consent calendar for consideration? Fred Hicks's hand continues to be up. Fred, did you have something to pull? Actually, I would like to specifically request a ruling on the of order that I made that um, for some reason wasn't made when I raised the points of order. So we're on consent items now. Uh, yeah, but you're breaking parliamentary procedure, Greg. When I raise points of order, if you ask the legal counsel, that actually requires a response. Actually, it doesn't, Mr. Hicks. That was public comment on non-agenda items. The board is not required to uh, respond to it. And I was going to join in that uh, actually uh, um, this item will be discussed further on uh, item uh, 11A. Um, so there'll be further response and discussion of that at that time. But at a point of order. A point of order is not something you can raise, Mr. Hicks. So I'm overruling you. You've had a chance to make your comment. Uh, and uh, there will be further discussion, as I said, on some of the procedural uh, issues uh, raised in your comment, although it's not required under a uh, uh, general public comment, but certainly during the uh, action item, we'll get back to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's entertain a motion on consent items alpha and bravo, A and B. Move to accept, accept items A and B on the consent calendar as presented. Second. Motion by Vice President Quinn, second by Director Carlin. Christy, roll call vote, please. Director Carlin. Aye. Director Grace. Aye. Director Jensen. Aye. Vice President Quinn. Aye. President Hahn. Aye. Motion carries five to zero for items Mr. A and B. And then- Mr. President. Yes. We do have another hand up. I don't know if it was regarding the consent calendar. Okay. Let's check on that. Make sure we didn't preemptively approve items A and B. Okay. Jiva? Jiva thank you, you for catching that, Christy, because I did have my hand up. Um, so thank you again. Um, yeah, I, I would ask um, the second, it was on the um, agenda item 11A from last month by um, general counsel. And it says that AB, 361 prohibits, prohibits the legislative body from taking any further action on items appearing on the meeting agenda until public access is restored. So uh, I don't me, know if you're going to say that was. Hold on a second, please. We're on the consent calendar. This doesn't pertain to the consent calendar. Oh, I thought the that was approving the minutes. And so uh, my thought was, well, can that meeting have been concluded? So that was how um, I get, get what you're saying, Greg. So did that clarify what I was asking, Greg? I, I think you're asking, could we continue with the meeting if I didn't offer public comment on information discussion and we did not take any action at that point or after? So yes, we could continue the meeting fine. And legal agrees. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, so items A and B are approved. Um, the person who pulled item C and D, who I think was Vice President Quinn, you have the floor. That is correct. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, with regard to uh, the, the, the quarterly investment report, looking at, I believe, page 16, uh, can Hamid clarify the fact that there is no um, money amount shown on the item under uh, for waste water enterprise fund. Yes, so 
The reason for that is essentially it was a negative. And so it, it came out of the then wastewater reserve a few items down. So if you'll see, there's a net change under the wastewater reserve of negative 43,344. That was basically subsidizing the wastewater enterprise fund. Um, so although we have you know, adopted increased rates, um, it's still, you know, we're not to the point yet where uh, the wastewater enterprise um, is in the positive yet. Okay, but um, and under the um, uh, activity report farther down in today's agenda, obviously we took in money for wastewater uh, every month. Uh, wouldn't that show up someplace? Where'd the money go? Well, the money certainly comes in, but the expenses are still higher than the revenues. And so, especially so in the first quarter of the year, when in July, uh, the district has to pay the pension UAL obligation in full uh, for the full year's worth, as well as the insurance costs we pay um, in July. So what happens is you have higher expenses at the beginning of the year. Um, eventually that will even out and the revenue should exceed the expenditures. Okay, so you're saying all the items in those accounts are net of expenses, is that correct? Correct. Okay, all right, uh, then moving to um, registry of warrants, page 12, um, uh, a red light flashed and I, I think that uh, we probably discussed it before, but it might be a good thing to bring up again regarding, for example, the Home Depot credit card, the Synchrony Bank uh, credit card with Amazon, and there's probably something in uh, Wix uh, in there perhaps. Uh, do we have, a, <laughs> the reason I'm thinking about this is obviously we have an issue with our former uh, general manager. We have, I have uh, personal experience with my former uh, employment where both the uh, controller and the general manager colluded to uh, break funds out using company credit cards and then disappeared. Now I grant you nobody on our payroll has just walked away and become invisible, but do we have some sort of a um, double check system to make sure that if collusion does occur, it has got to be pretty widespread in order for it to be a problem. I mean, who's checking the purchases that go on credit cards? That's what I'm asking. Sure. So. Um, our, the, the policy says, or our code says that credit card purchases, you know, should be reserved for items that cannot be done on account. And so um, it then follows our requisition process in which all purchases require requisition, and then those have to be approved by the general manager. Um, so any items that show up um, on these credit card purchases should have already been approved by the general manager. Um, when the invoices then come in, they get routed to our accounts payable. Um, uh, our accountant handles those duties. She uh, gets the uh, okay to pay on all the invoices from the supervisors and department heads, and then um, submits what we call a request for payment um, along with a draft check register. I review that draft check register with all the requests for payments uh, that have all of the invoices and the approved uh, requisitions. Um, and so that would be the, the case for all the credit card transactions as well. Um, so then I sign off on those um, and then they, the payments are made. So that's how we have the, the current process. Very good, thank you. I appreciate the uh, clarification. And I therefore move to accept items C and D on the consent calendar as presented. I have a motion, how about a second? Second. Motion by Vice President Quinn, second by Director Carlin. Christy, roll call vote for items C and D, please. Director Carlin? Aye. Director Grace? Aye. Director Jensen? Aye. 
Vice President Quinn. Aye. President Hahn. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. The consent calendar is approved, uh, uh, consented to. Uh, <laughs> number 10, the disclosures by board of directors, Ms. McEwen. Board members are asked to disclose any outside communications with individuals and organizations that have an action item on this agenda that pertains directly to them or their specific personal or private interests and which communication is not included or disclosed in the agenda package so that all interested persons have an equal opportunity to express and represent their interests. Anybody? No. Nothing. No, no, I see all no's. Uh, thank you, everyone. I have nothing to disclose as well. 11 action items. Alpha adopt resolution 21 slash 22 dash 15 authorizing the continued use of teleconferencing accessibility procedures for public meetings. Mr. Davis. Thank you, President Hahn. As long as we continue to meet remotely, this will be a recurring agenda item. Uh, as you recall from the last board meeting, we adopted resolution 2122-13 uh, pursuant to AB 361. Uh, that was specific legislation that as a result of the uh, COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic that the uh, governor had suspended certain Brown Act teleconferencing procedures uh, to allow agencies to meet remotely like this. Uh, in order to continue um, these kind of procedures, what agencies have to do now is to make findings uh, that emergencies continue to exist uh, that require or that uh, um, help promote um, health and safety by meeting remotely um, because of potential uh, risks of spreading COVID uh, and uh, other um, similar concerns. So one part of what we're doing tonight is we're required every 30 days if we are going to continue to remote to, uh, do remote meetings to make uh, those kind of findings. And in fact, um, while things in some ways are better, uh, there's still considerable risk um, there are uh, continuing surges um, uh, with COVID. So a lot of the guidance uh, regarding masking, uh, social distancing, other things remain in place. So the board uh, is authorized if it makes the findings uh, proposed to continue for another 30 days to uh, continue with remote meetings. Um, what I'd like to focus on, and this is uh, in response to some of the comments raised uh, earlier, uh, regarding what are the actual procedures of AB 361? What, what does it require? Uh, AB 361 did not change the Brown Act uh, other than allowing the remote meeting procedures uh, uh, to be in place. So, uh, but there are some technical procedural requirements and let me clarify them. One is the opportunity, if you are meeting remotely, that the public has to have opportunities consistent with other provisions of the Brown Act uh, to address the board in real time, meaning to have uh, some kind of either uh, telephonic or uh, video um, uh, rights to address the board consistent uh, with the Brown Act. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, uh, about that. So that goes to oral comments. And there's probably a bit of a mistake in the agenda, and I'll take responsibility for that because different bodies have different uh, technical capabilities, but I did include um, uh, in the gender report for opportunities for real time in writing. Uh, and that's not something actually we are technically um, able to do here. That's why as noted in the agenda, we request uh, email comments to be sent uh, in advance um, of the meetings in part because that allows uh, people to review them, particularly the board. Uh, so you can understand the comments, particularly if they're lengthy uh, it's not a requirement for comment. It's simply a, a, um, a recommendation if people are going to use a written procedure. Uh, I think it's difficult for Christy in these situations. And with the Zoom uh, platform, there aren't chat rooms as some other agencies have that would allow uh, some comments to be made uh, in quote unquote real time. But again, the written uh, comments uh, do not need to be made in real time. What has to be in real time is the ability to make a public comment at appropriate times. Um, and I'll touch on that in just a sec. The other issue uh, regarding uh, disruption of meetings, AB 361 
requires that if there's a electronic malfunction, so if people are not uh, uh, able, not that they are not, there's not a public comment period, but if technically there is no connection there and nobody uh, can uh, speak on certain items, that's when board can't take action on things. We have not had that situation. We've not had a, a failure of any electronics uh, that precluded public comment. I think the concern of the speakers goes to the timing uh, of public comments, which is something different and something that's not changed by uh, AB 361. Um, if you read the language, it's the same language in the Brown Act, that the public should be provided an opportunity, interesting choice of articles, an opportunity uh, to address um, uh, the board on things. In our agendas, we have multiple opportunities for the public to do that. Uh, there is the public comment period on non-agenda items uh, that we've already had uh, tonight. Um, then for each of our action items, our typical practice has been, and in the uh, previous meetings while we've gone remote, uh, has always been to allow public comments on each action item there. Agencies handle public comments differently on action items. Uh, some agencies uh, do them for each individual items. Some uh, allow kind of like what we do with our general public comment, uh, have one opportunity uh, for people to do it. Uh, there's no hard and fast rule on when that is, as long as there's an opportunity before or during public comment, uh, before action is taken. The concerns, so that, that's something different. The concerns go to what we, uh, I think, are the informational uh, items that are on the agenda. Uh, those are interesting items because there are simply reports. There's no description. Uh, of any action. And because of that, indeed, no action can take, be taken. And the board does not take action on any of those items because they're not even full agenda descriptions. It's simply director comments, general counsel comments, report from the general manager. They're simply informational items. So in those particular items, the board chair has some discretion uh, as to whether to take public comments on those or not because they are not uh, action items. Um, so that's more of a discretionary matter for the board. The concern of the Brown Act focuses primarily on uh, the action items. And in our meetings, there has always been an opportunity and there always should be opportunities for public comments on action agenda uh, items before or during. Uh, and as I said, that can take the form of each item or a single uh, opportunity to do so. Uh, the informational items are again, are more discretionary. Uh, as to how public comment uh, is handled uh, on that. So in, in short, AB 361 did not change the Brown Act other than essentially if we make the, uh, the findings of the uh, uh, emergency conditions that we can meet remotely. And if we do meet remotely, um, there have to be opportunities for real time for oral comments uh, to be made uh, to the board. Uh, on things, not necessarily written comments. Um, and uh, again, uh, AB 361 did not change any requirements regarding uh, general Brown Act uh, procedural requirements. So that concludes my report, uh, Mr. President. Again, uh, based on the uh, existing conditions out there that at least for the next 30 days, the proposed resolution would give the option uh, for us to continue to hold uh, remote meetings. Thank you, Mr. Davis. We'll go to the public first. Christy, are there hands up in the public? Uh, yes, Fred Hicks. Mr. Hicks, welcome in again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, so specifically, I have two questions. The first is, with the real-time comment, when is the appropriate time for a point of order from a member of the public to be addressed? Though? That's the first question I have. The second question is specifically the section 54954.3, which states every agenda for regular meeting shall provide opportunity of the publics to directly address the legislative body on any item of interest to the public. Before the consideration of that, the legislative body's consideration of that item. Now that's the only 
place that I read it that it can be excluded is if a committee has heard the item where public input has been heard within that committee. I don't know how staff reports and discussion items actually fall into that. Um, so that's actually where I'm a little confused because if the only place to raise a point of order is in public comment, and then there's no response required, that doesn't actually address the point of order as stated in parliamentary procedure. So I'm a little confused on how the meeting is supposed to be addressed from a public side. Mr. Hicks, are you, are, have you concluded your comments? Those are my two main questions from Mr. Davis Carroll. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another hand. Um, Jeeva? Ms. Fever, welcome, welcome in. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, this new um, resolution is different than the last resolution. So first of all, I'd like to know why the verbiage um, isn't as strong as it is in the other, the ones that I read previously from our October meeting. And now it just doesn't seem as definitive about you know, our access. And then the second thing is, um, I know Chrissy has a lot there to manage, everything she's managing. Is there not the opportunity for staff or someone else to be there monitoring emails and doing that re real time? I don't see that as a real difficult technical thing not to um, be able to provide us um, continued um, correspondence with on that. And um, I hear what you're saying, you know, uh, as far as the technical issues and real time public comments and interruptions, but this community has been very good about it. And Mr. Han's been excellent in the past about allowing discussion because that is an opportunity that we get to hear from staff and the roads people and the water people at times. And we get a little bit more information, which I think is great towards transparency. So. I'm hoping that despite what legal has said that, you know, the president will be persuaded to allow this and, and monitor it like you have been before. I've thought you've done a great job and I would really appreciate that consideration. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jeeva. Any other hands in the public? Um, Fred's hand is up again. Fred, come on in, what do you got? I would just like a response from legal to the questions that I posed. It's up to there. Um, it's up to Don if he wants to respond to those. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy to, Greg. I was waiting for comments to end. Uh, okay. I think our preferred practice often is to allow all the comments to come in and not individualize them. So I've been taking notes. And if there are no further comments, glad to respond. You have no further hands. OK. Uh, Mr. Hicks, with respect to your question about points of order, as I stated, we're not a parliamentarian uh, body uh, here. And so, you know, the, the public raising points of order, um, certainly if you look at an agenda uh, and you see something that, that's amiss, there's an opportunity at the public comment time on uh, 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 matters, or if it's a specific agenda item that's agendized for action, that would be a time when you can make that question too. Uh, points of order, again, on reports, there's not action being taken. So it's hard to understand what the procedural uh, concern would be when these are, uh, again, just report items. Uh, with respect to Ms. Freebert's comment about the resolutions are different. Actually, they're not. If you look at them, uh, I've tried simply shortened it by incorporating a lot of the findings from the prior ordinance into this ordinance. So it wouldn't go on uh, with background information. Uh, it's the continuing um, um, uh, nature of it. So we could do it either way, but it wasn't intended to take out anything. It actually just incorporates all of what's in the prior uh, ordinance and then makes the, the, the new findings on it. And it, of course, doesn't change uh, any of the procedures. And they're still applicable, no doubt about that. Thank you, Mr. Davis. 
Director Carlin, action on uh, Nothing. Director Grace? I had nothing, sir. Director Jensen? Uh, just, just a couple of clarifications as far as what people are saying here. Um, I would agree in the past few meetings, uh, public comments seem to disappear uh, for staff reports uh, and other issues. And to that, I would say items of the, of the public interest, you never know what's gonna come up until the actual report comes out. So I, I think the public still needs the ability to, to at least say something about those. That's certainly been past practice not only with these Zoom meetings, but also on the in-person meetings. And I, I don't know why that went away. Uh, if it were to go away permanently, I, I would hope that as a board, uh, we would make that decision collectively rather than an individual changing that. That's all I have to say about that. Appreciate that, Mr. Jensen. Vice President and Quinn. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I have a few items. Um, I note that this time around, probably for a good reason, we're starting with public comments before board comments. And I think that is a good move. And I hope we make that a general trend because we have not done it in the past to my recollection. Item two, I'm just wondering, technically, is it impossible for us to see a, uh, a raised hands person's face when they're talking? Is that beyond our capabilities. I think it would be a lot more um, uh, similar to an in-person meeting, if you will. Is it, can we do that? Christy question? I don't believe so. Um, I can look into it, but as far, Hamid might be the better person to ask that, but um, I haven't been able to do it. I, as far as I know, I think if we promote the attendee to a panelist, then I know that's possibly one way to do it. Um, and then we just probably have to, uh, I don't know what the demote, I guess, back uh, when they're finished. Um, I can look at the, the settings to see if there's other ways of doing that just from the attendee there. It, it may be possible. Okay. okay. I'd appreciate it. I think it'd be a good move. Um, item three uh, regarding what Fred is talking about, what Jeeva has talked about also uh, on the staff reports and info items, as long as we maintain the three minute limit on comments, I can understand that uh, the public, someone in the public might have a question about something uh, in the staff, a staff report that did not occur to the board members. And I see no real downside to allowing uh, the public to chime in and ask the question. We obviously don't want it to get out of hand. We don't want long speeches but, uh, or complaints, but uh, I think that would be a very good uh, move. And I don't think it would add that much time to the uh, 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 overall meeting time. And the fourth item is uh, recommended motion I don't think we have a sitting manager. I think we have a general oh, manager. Oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Other that. than that, <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> Next item is to incorporate. We forgot to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that was it. Vice President Quinn? Yes, sir. All right, I appreciate all those comments. I appreciate the comments by Director Jensen as well. Um, on that topic, it was uh, under my uh, opinion that the meetings were just getting bogged down with Q&A sessions at the time where we're just receiving reports. So um, I'm, I would be happy to reinstate asking for public comments um, on the discussion and information items, but not at the expense of, of bogging down the meeting. Uh, and, and, and I've been attending board meetings since before I was on the board, quite a few of them, in fact. I, I remember no time this board ever taking action without asking for public input. And I would never, I would, uh, in the uh, interest of transparency, I would never ask um, that of this board or any other board. And I would object to the same exact thing happening. On this resolution, I hope that my colleagues 
continue the use of teleconferencing, mainly due to the fact of the extremely low vaccination rates in Kern County and another surge of the spread of COVID occurring. So along those lines, do I have a motion from my colleagues on this item? I move that the board adopt resolution number 21 slash 22 dash 15, authorizing the general manager to conduct or to continue to implement and utilize teleconference accessibility procedures to conduct public meetings pursuant to Assembly Bill 361. Second. Okay. I have a motion by Vice President Quinn. I think the second was Director Jensen. Christy, roll call vote, please. Director Carlin. Aye. Director Grace. Aye. Director Jensen. Aye. Vice President Quinn. Aye. President Hahn. Aye. Motion carries five to zero. Item B, authorized task order with TransTech Engineers Inc. for civil engineering services for entry gate reconfiguration design. Mr. Mallinan, please. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, this item is to hopefully help us uh, uh, kickstart the, um, I think, long-awaited project that will deal with our entry gate. And I noted in my uh, background that in 2018, we began to do this project and effectively suspended the, the, the whole of it while we focused on the most critical component, which was the drainage. And as time has gone on and we've learned more, we realized that there is much more area than had been originally thought of or put into consideration with the gatehouse area. And that uh, is the notion of 110 feet of right of way. Bear Valley Road is 110 feet wide. Um, all the way from Cumberland down to uh, the end of our ownership, which is just past uh, where the road curves to go due south. And with that, the idea is that uh, we have many more options than had been originally thought of or identified when Will Dan was working on this project when I first arrived back in 2018. And with that, um, the idea that we may, uh, if, you, if you look at 110 feet of right of way, that is the equivalent of 10 lanes of traffic that could be put into that width. Now, with that, I envision uh, that we have hundreds of feet to move that gatehouse, preferably east from where it is right now. Uh, to help Im improve the movement of the vehicles coming in. Uh, we can, I think, add lanes of traffic, uh, both in and perhaps out. Uh, we can uh, do better merging of the lanes that are coming in, improve access uh, even to the police department. So as we've talked about it, the, the next concept that came up uh, expanded the area of focus from just the gatehouse area to the idea that because we have 110 feet of right of way, if we were to take a look at uh, creating more passable lanes from Cumberland down to the gatehouse area and then uh, proceeding all the way down to Cummings Valley Road, the idea that we may be able to accommodate uh, an evacuation route, envisioning two lanes of traffic, two lanes exiting on Cumberland as an example. And again, we're looking at, at an evacuation event. And then two lanes from Bear Valley Road, when they converge, they could conceivably, theoretically, merge into four lanes so there are no impediments uh, or obstacles to that flow of traffic uh, and potentially all the way down to Cummings Valley Road. So uh, we asked TransTech uh, to give us some uh, quotes to do uh, some beginning work and what they uh, really looked at was a survey. And so the significant amount here is for an identification uh, and the imaging and uh, monuments and 
uh, aerial uh, orthotic photos that will identify that 110 right of way and then also identify what uh, Kern County has. And I will tell you, uh, they had contacted uh, Kern County. Uh, I have calls into Kern County, have not been able to get the definitive answers, but certainly to the extent they have uh, uh, relevant survey information, uh, to share with us, we should be able to uh, use that and then uh, hopefully not have to incur all the costs and, and we're open for that. But nonetheless, what are the obstacles in that right of way, whosoever it is, that would need to be overcome to, to, to further the concept? And I um, added in my staff report what I think is, uh, is also an important consideration, which is, um, you know, it is consistent with the recently adopted uh, hazard mitigation plan at the county. Uh, as such, it would be eligible for grants in a, uh, a higher priority than projects that are not uh, in, in a hazard mitigation plan. So we, we have, I think, that advantage. And then we've also uh, been uh, contacting the county to have them pursue uh, some grants that only they can apply for. So we're hopeful that maybe the, uh, the opportunities to have this paid for uh, outside of ourselves could present themselves to us. But in any event, that is the concept. So we survey that whole corridor. We understand what um, obstacles are in our way, uh, what the train is like, what is the potential. And hopefully from there, uh, we can, if that's the idea, uh, either uh, accept and expand on that concept or reject it if it doesn't work for some reasons. And um, moving the, the gatehouse is uh, certainly a cost, but we end up getting ideas, we get schematics, we get price estimates so that we might uh, eventually do the project down at the gate and make those kinds of improvements and to the extent they're tied in with uh, any sort of uh, an evacuation project, uh, we can make it work. So we, we had this reviewed by the infrastructure committee. Their recommendation was to do the full uh, survey from Cumberland down to Cummings Road. Uh, what they had seen has been slightly amended as uh, I took that and had the uh, engineers uh, incorporated into this quote. So this Total uh, project is $58,423. And uh, it is recommended for the board to approve and authorize execution of a task order with TransTech to do this work. And obviously they're subbing out uh, the um, survey work to a third party. Thank you, Mr. Mellonen. Comments from the public, Christy. Um, Kara Cooper. Ms. Cooper, welcome in. Hi. Um, yeah, on this, the most thing I can see as a problem is with the SCC uh, poles. Since they have just hardened the system and replaced all the poles along this route, uh, I would really want to see, before you approve this, to see how much it would cost to move any of those poles. You're also going to have to take into consideration that AT&T, race, et cetera, are on the bottom, and they will also be uh, adding costs to this project. So I just want to see a uh, total cost analysis, at least on that, before we uh, hire an engineering firm to uh, start the work. Uh, it would have been really great had we uh, contacted Edison before they did all that system hardening. We might have had a much better quote and our price. Anyway, that's all I have. Appreciate that, Ms. Cooper. Any more hands? Jeeva? Ms. Freebert, welcome in. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, the two tasks list there, uh, task one and two, are uh, addressing what Kara said regarding the polls, locations, reviewing Kern County's available plans for future traffic and stuff. And before we go into all this wonderful layout of these options, you know, that's only a few thousand dollars that could be spent. Um, and I don't know if our staff can do it or not. I know Bill says he's been making contact, so we might have to sub it out to get some um, 
faster time responses. But until we really know the cost of moving all these poles from Cumberland and you know all the way down to the gate and then 600 feet or whatever it is past our gate, you know, I think it's not spending the money wisely yet. We could in the future, but also what, what are we doing making an evaluation all the way down to Bear Valley, I mean, to Cummings Valley Road when that's not ours at all. And um, other than that, we'd have to work with them. So I just don't understand that. Um, the second thing is RFP or RFQ, um, that should have been put out. I don't know that one was ever put out. And um, I know that there's um, requirements based upon um, Kern County multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation. And you said eventually, Bill, we can make use of this. Well, I think we need to put a few things ahead of that. And water is our main priority. So every time I look at these pictures and I see the Taj Mahal of Gates, which is beautiful, wonderful, we all want great egress and ingress. It's like our water is our main priority. So I would ask the board to reject this $58,000 and reconsider just task one and two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Freebert. Any more comments from the public? None. Director Carlin. I, uh, I don't have any comments on this, Greg. Uh, um, Bill mentioned the infrastructure committee looked at this. Uh, we dissected it uh, um, and now I'm prepared to actually move forward, uh, at least get the project off the ground. I'm not saying that we even have to move any poles or anything because we really just don't know what the fiscal impact is. So I'm prepared to vote yes on this. Thank you, sir. Director Grace. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I would just say uh, the key thing to remember in this in the context of this is it's information gathering. This is the first step. So I definitely appreciate Ms. Cooper and, and uh, uh, Ms. Freevert's uh, comments about the poll relocation. Um, we won't know until we do this. So this is a, a key step. It's a key step in the overall uh, the overall evaluation of an evacuation plan, uh, which has been a long time coming and is growing more necessary by by the day and the and the week. Um, so, I, I like Mr. Carl and I. You know, we uh, we did obviously look at this in infrastructure committee. We talked about all of these concepts, and um, this is uh, the first step in many, uh, but it is key in the overall uh, review of. of uh, of public safety and an evacuation concept. And that's why I, I'm ready to support it as well. Director Jensen. Yeah, I, I have a bunch of problems with this. Um, so going back to like February, early March of this year, I noticed a bunch of uh, surveying going on at the intersection of, of Cummings Valley Road and Bear Valley Road. So I reached out to some people that I knew and I learned that uh, the county has applied for a clean air grant to put in a roundabout at that intersection, basically a traffic circle. Uh, it would eliminate the four-way stop and you'd have a traffic circle going around. So I contacted some people at Public Works. I said, you know, how's this going to work? You've got 85-foot big rigs coming out of the, the uh, greenhouses and, and how are they going to traverse this traffic circle? Uh, they assured me that, that all of that was good. I proposed some alternative ideas that I thought would, would make that intersection safer, which would have included adding a two-way left turn lane on Cummings Valley Road, adding a two-way left turn lane from the church, uh, passing the school to Cummings Valley Road on Bear Valley Road. And to that, they said they didn't have enough easement to add even a two-way left turn lane. So without reaching out to the county first, we're kind of putting the cart before the horse here and and not seeing what they have already. I mean, $58,000 is, is a lot to pay for an information gathering, when if we can just go to the county, look at their as-builts, find out where the easements begin and end, and, and how much options, how many options there are of, of changing that. But, you know, it all boils down to this is the county's road, and they're going to do with it what they want. Uh, for us to spend money to survey the county road, I, I think is foolish. The other thing with this, this item 
is that these two items really should be separate. It should be the gate, and then we should be talking about emergency exits. They should be two different things. I think widening one exit and calling that, oh, we're working on emergency exits is kind of disingenuous because our, our, our problems with natural disasters aren't just fires. They're also earthquakes and landslides. So if you have an earthquake come through, which I'm not sure we had one earlier, but anyway, um, if you have an earthquake come through and, and collapse our one wide exit, now we have nothing. So if, if we're gonna be honest about emergency exits, we should be working on another exit and not just widening our only exit that we have. So uh, I, and then the other problem with this is I, I kind of agree with Jiva, it should go out to an RFP. I'd hate to get into another Will Dan uh, episode where, where we just start farming everything out to one engineering firm um, and we end up in the same place we are right now with Will Dan. Um, I, I looked through the company's uh, kind of volume of work that they've, they've posted on their, their website. I've, I've looked at other, other uh, source of, sources of information. I can see that they have a lot of experience widening roads, which you know I, I guess widening Bear Valley Road would play to their strengths, uh, but I didn't really see anything that, that might match up to uh, you know, doing a new gatehouse. So I, I, would, I would ask to see uh, other uh, pieces of their work that would, that would match up to what we need them to do. Um, but that's all I have for this. Thank you, sir. Vice President Quinn. I have no comment. I heard the general manager say that uh, if we can reach out with the county and see what they've done, that we could reduce this. And that's the $48,000 instead of $58,000, so saving 10 grand. I believe that this survey is uh, the, the, the first step to, to seeing if we can widen the road. I think the gatehouse project was in the budget a long time ago, and it's still, the money's there. We can still, it's not like we're gonna extend the budget. I hear Jeeva's comment about water being our most important thing, but it, it can't be our only thing. We, we have to be able to multitask and we have that capability. Mm -hmm. We have talented staff and we have the funding to get that done. Uh, if the traffic circle never materializes, then I don't see how that should delay our plan to at least survey. So I'm with Director Grace and Carlin that we should authorize this, but only spend 48 if we can, if we can piggyback on what they've already done. Uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion on this item. I move that the board of directors authorize the execution of a task order with TransTech Engineering Incorporated for the BVCSD entry gate and emergency exit exit layout projects, including option two surveys for a total, and I'd like to add not to exceed 58,423. Second. I have a motion by Director Carlin, a second by Director Grace. Ms. McEwen, roll call vote, please. Director Carlin? Aye. Director Grace? Aye. Director Jensen? No. Vice President Quinn? Aye. President Hahn? I vote aye. Motion carries four to one with Director Jensen in dissent. Item Charlie, accept and approve five-year capital improvement plan for water division. Mr. Malinan, back to you. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, uh, as you recall, when we initially had our water rate survey and that was completed, we subsequently had the board approve a capital improvement plan for the five years. It was essentially what was in that study. And to me, that's really just a, a separate identification of that CIP. So the board subsequently took action for both our sewer CIP and our solid waste CIP. And this one took a little bit more time, as you may see, because it um, incorporates the efforts that we've had to make and, and some remnant of expenses on generator uh, installations. And certainly we 
uh, borrowed some money to be able to acquire and put in some generators. And then this actually extends an additional two years over what was done back in 2019. So uh, staff got together and looked at the items that had already been identified. Uh, obviously some things had to be delayed as we put resources towards the emergency power generation. But now we've carried it out a couple more years. Probably the most significant uh, piece of information for you in the big scheme of this all is uh, we use the model that was uh, generated for the rate study for water. We've incorporated these capital items with the revenue and expenditures that have been projected through the years and it works. And by that, I mean, at the end of the five-year uh, CIP, we've paid for our operations. We've been able to handle the capital outlay, uh, the debt service ratio uh, that gets dealt with sooner. But at the end of that period, we still have some excess of fund balance over the required policy level. So uh, with that, we feel comfortable that uh, we're laying this out. This gives us some direction. Uh, as we go about budgeting for the next few years, these are the items that we'll be looking to uh, incorporate. And it gives us, um, my experience, uh, board members, is part of what a CIP does for us and for you is as we lay out our future plans, things happen. Pardon me. And some of them are uh, that uh, there's a problem someone uh, in a neighborhood thinks should be fixed, and that's legitimate to bring to your attention. If it's, if it's a significant enough thing, that's fine, but something has to move, if that makes sense. We, we don't have to, to just do everything. Uh, and some other times, uh, if people aren't aware of it, and we can note that that is in our CIP, and it's going to be done two years from now, that, that satisfies people's uh, need to get things done. So having a CIP is important. Uh, having it um, financially responsible, i.e. at the end of the five-year period, we come out uh, where we've always said we wanted to be uh, is good. So we would uh, recommend approval as presented and stand ready to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. Going to the public, Ms. McEwen. Kara Cooper. Ms. Cooper. Um, hi, I just have one question. It does not consider any of the laterals, which Mr. Mallon has specifically stated that we need to start replacing. And I think that should be included in this because um, those are the ones that are leaking and we should have some sort of plan to start replacing them. That's all. Thank you. There are no more hands. Director Carlin. No comments. Director Grace. Uh, I had no uh, specific comment, just uh, again, reiterating to everybody, this is a planning document and uh, an important part of our budgeting going forward. So we're not, not spending money now, but we're making diligent and prudent efforts to, to plan for the future. That's all I have. Thank you, sir. Director Jensen. And just to clarify, uh, any expenditures over the statutory maximum, they still have to be approved individually, yes? Yes. yes. So again, our, our procurement policy, uh, if there's an item that we budget for that is $5,000, that doesn't necessarily uh, require board approval, but over my authority, certainly it does. Thank you. Nothing else. Thank you, sir. Vice President Quinn. No comment. Uh, to Ms. Cooper's point, I, I don't know that we can budget in our plan for what she's asking for. We just don't have the money for replacing those, those lines. That's going to have to be a much larger project. That, that's, that's my thoughts on that. And agree with Director Grace that this is a roadmap. It's a plan. We can change the plan. We're not authorizing these expenditures today. We're just authorizing that we made that this is a plan, um, what we plan to do. And with that, I'll entertain a motion. Mr. President, if I might, yes. I, I would, I would like to take the opportunity to to address that question because 
as I was going to report during my general manager report, one of the other items that the infrastructure committee uh, dealt with was um, using, and in that case, TransTech, uh, to do a, an analysis and an assessment so in the, as I think our board understands, but hopefully the public will learn more about, we did the first phase of a very significant engineering study that was going to identify our assets, assess their condition, and subsequently develop a plan to finance their replacements. And when we talk about facilities, we're talking about everything in our water system, including the mains and the laterals to a home or a property. Similarly with the sewer system. And as that was moving forward, the district moved forward with uh, rate adjustments, recognizing the, the magnitude of that undertaking and the time it would take. Uh, we moved forward with rate adjustments that were intended to essentially stabilize the financial condition of those enterprise funds, water being the first and most significant of them. And within that, we did generate about $750,000 towards capital outlay, which there had not been anything designated for capital outlay in for years and years. So I've, I've kind of uh, characterized that money as being uh, the, the resource to fix what's above ground. We have not, and in, in the conversation at the infrastructure committee, we have not completed that condition assessment. Uh, they asked that um, Director Carlin and myself and uh, Mr. Paparella, who sits on our uh, committee, infrastructure committee, and is a registered engineer who deals with water and sewer systems, uh, develop a request for proposals that would, I think, narrow the scope a little bit and open that up to many other um, engineering firms. But the, the intent of that process is to get that next step, which is the condition assessment of what's below ground and develop a plan as to how to attack what is the issue of an aging infrastructure, infrastructure that will ultimately need to be replaced. How do we do that on 110 miles of varying sizes, varying uh, materials, and, and uh, some variation in age? So um, the the system that Ms. Cooper was referring to is, is being addressed, but it is not as a part of this. This continues to be that what is above ground uh, part of the system. Many, many pumps and motors and valves and electrical panels and, and wells and so on, as you see in that CIP. Thank you. Appreciate all that clarification. Um, further discussion? All right, entertain a motion. Mr. President, I move the Board of Directors accept and approve the five-year capital improvement plan for the Water Division. Second. Motion by Director Grace. Was that Quinn or Carlin? Quinn. Quinn. Second by Quinn. Christy, roll call vote, please. Director Carlin? Aye. Director Grace? Aye. Director Jensen? Aye. I'm sorry? Aye. Thank you. Vice President Quinn? Aye. President Hahn? Aye. That motion carries five to zero. Item Delta, adopt resolution 21 slash 22 16, designating traffic regulatory signs as surplus property and authorizing their disposal by sale or auction. I'm guessing, Mr. Malinen. Mr. President, members of the board, you approved the, the surplusing of the street name signs. And we've also been busy replacing the other signs, the regulatories, the stop signs, the curve signs, uh, et cetera. And so um, if, if you get an opportunity, everyone, to go to govdeals.com uh, backslash Bear Valley CSD, you will see the 100 and uh, Don will tell us 140 street name signs or whatever. Uh, that are currently on auction. And we just would like to do the same with these other signs that we've taken off and, and uh, 
they really don't have a whole lot of value as materials for recycling. We may, uh, if it's big enough, uh, Larry Wiggins says we might use some of the aluminum and, and use that in some fabrication if needed. But other than that, uh, they don't really bring in a whole lot and we would do better, I believe, at an auction. So that's the intent of this is to be a little more specific about that other category of sign. Thank you. Okay, appreciate that, sir. Th this is this was fun for me. I think it's great to have all, an old street sign from the Bear Valley. Let's go to the public, Ms. McEwen. There are no hands. Very good, no, Director Carlin. Uh, no comments. Director Grace. Uh, nothing for me, sir. Director Jensen. Nothing, sir. Vice President Quinn. No comment. Thank you. Okay, I think this is a fun one. And uh, you go on Gov deals, but nobody should bid on the one that I've already bid on, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'll entertain a motion, please. I move the Board of Directors adopt resolution 20 slash 21 dash 16, replace traffic regulatory signs as surplus property and authorizing their disposal by auction or sale with the proceeds returning to the roads fund. Second. I'll take a second from Director Jensen and the motion was made by Director Carlin. Ms. McEwen, roll call vote, please. Director Carlin. Aye. Director Grace. Aye. Director Jensen. Aye. Vice President Quinn. Aye. President Hahn. Aye. That carries five to zero. Item ECHO, adopt resolution 21 slash 22-17, approving applications for funds under California Department of Parks and Recreation per capita grant program and approve a memorandum of understanding with the Bear Valley Springs Association for the development and implementation of projects using per capita grant program funds. Mr. Mallon. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, um, as you may know, uh, there was a Proposition 68 approved a few years ago and it created funding for uh, parks um, and recreation. And it is uh, essentially an entitlement grant. Uh, you, you really just need to apply for it. Uh, and we have a, a, a place in that queue. The district could receive, uh, I've used $180,000 roughly as an amount of money that we can use for recreational facilities, let's put it that way. And so uh, given that we lease all of the recreational facilities in Bear Valley Springs to the uh, BVSA, it seemed to me uh, that we ought to work with them and allow them to make use of these entitlement funds that would come to the district. Um, and they uh, do have some projects that they believe they would use these funds for it gets a little more technical because we are the recipient and we're essentially granting them, giving the money to them. So uh, legal has developed uh, the resolution, which we need uh, first and foremost to make application for those funds that are designated for us. And then secondly, uh, to enter into an agreement with the association that spells out basically that they are responsible they assume all of those responsibilities and obligations under the grant for all aspects, including the matching portion. And, and in our conversations with the general manager, and we, we also had this a little bit at the liaison meeting last week, that's all uh, good by the association. They're excited about the opportunity to do something more than they had uh, already been planning uh, with these funds. So that's the backdrop. And then I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. Davis to uh, discuss any uh, legal issues, unless you have some questions for me at this point. Well, we can we can ask our questions after we hear from Mr. Davis, unless someone on the board wants to, we'll, I'll come to the public after both men have spoken. Don, it's all yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. President. So. Just briefly on the two uh, uh, legal aspects on the resolution, I appreciate Mr. Mellon trying to put that on me, but actually there was a state template uh, that we had to adopt. So I simply cleaned it up. It's what we have to do. Uh, and, and I, you know, uh, it's, uh, is what it is. 
Um, but these are the requirements of the program. So we have to uh, adopt this to even make the applications. And then as uh, I think Bill pointed out and what we had to sort of figure out because of our unusual relationship with the BVSA is because uh, the fact that these are grants to a public agency. So we need to be the applicant, um, but we want the BVSA paying for them. Um, but there are some contracting issues that we're going to have to take care of because we're a public agency. So there's a lot of joint work on this. And so the proposed agreement is really to kind of cover each aspect from planning uh, to development to uh, then uh, implementation of the project, including the fact that essentially when these facilities are completed, depending on what they are, we may need to uh, amend the lease uh, to include them, but this essentially covers and st uh, basically steps in that uh, uh, requires the, B uh, the BVSA to maintain the facilities, regardless of whether uh, or the timing of inclusion as part of the lease as facilities, community facilities, as the lease defines them, uh, and to maintain them consistent with the uh, same requirements too. I don't know if Bill has an update on their reaction to this. We, we had to kind of put this together um, uh, quickly uh, because of the timing on that. So I don't know if there's any feedback you've had, Bill, but because of the, um, we have not fully negotiated with that as part of our recommended action, uh, if the board desires to pursue these uh, uh, funds, which we would encourage you to do, that the final form of the agreement be subject to uh, approval as to form and legal content by the general manager and myself uh, here, just to make sure we're we're fully protected and we're certainly open to some minor changes from the BVSA, but uh, hopefully this will um, uh, be acceptable in, in general form to them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. To the public, Ms. McEwen, who do you have? Jeeva. Ms. Freebert. Thank you very much. Um, so you're expecting it to be about 178,000. So it's not definitive that we're getting it. That's the first question. And then the second is, can you expand on what the 20% local cost is? Is that coming from the district or matching funds? And then the allocated estimated allocated cost for admin. I think you said there might be some there. And then, um, Bill, if you could share the ideas that the BVSA had vetted or if you're comfortable with that or what they were thinking they were going to select on those potential um, improvements. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Jeeva. There are no more hands. OK. President? Yes, please. So the first first question, uh, as I mentioned, it is essentially an, an entitlement. So uh, on the presumption that the uh, application meets the qualification criteria that is laid down, we've shared all that with the association, so they're aware, um, we are eligible for that amount of money. And the association would need to pay their 20% match. So uh, that's their obligation and not the districts. Um, the only, and, and I, I would say the, dis, the, the association had some projects that they were um, interested in. I believe their highest priority was uh, a structure to be located at the park area that could accommodate um, uh, basketball as a, as a, a covered, uh, I don't know if arena is the right word, but a, a covered court type of facility. So um, that would seem in keeping with providing recreational facilities. And I, I'm not questioning its eligibility, but that seemed to be their high um, priority. That was my recollection and, and perhaps um, uh, Director Hahn or Jensen had some more they could add from that uh, liaison meeting. Thank you, sir. Director Carlin, floor is yours. Uh, I don't have any comments. Mr. Director President. Uh, yes, Mr. President, I, I think this is a great deal. Um, if we as a public agency have the ability and the structure to 
avail ourselves of a grant like this. And if it flows to the association, it's ultimately to the benefit of the entire community. So I think it's a, I think it's a winning, uh, winning situation here. Director Jensen. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, the the ideas that that the association had for uh, using these funds, I think, were worthwhile and uh, uh, are to the benefit of the community. Basically, the the leading one that uh, Mr. Mallinan was talking about is essentially a covered sports pavilion that would be uh, what in the parking area of the baseball fields. I, I believe they said it would be, and it. It's large enough to accommodate two basketball courts and it's a multi-purpose court so you can do basketball you can do pickleball you can do uh, inline hockey um, volleyball so it, it, it's a multi-purpose court that uh, that would uh, be the benefit of, of everyone at all ages so uh, I think it's a great idea thank you sir vice president Quinn uh, no comment thank you I'll echo both Director Grace and Director Jensen's comments. I think it's a great use of, of uh, funds and revenue, and it's coming through grants. That's great. Uh, we'll entertain a motion on this item, please, colleagues. I move that the board adopt resolution number 21-22-17, approving applications for funds under the per capita grant program and approve an agreement with the Bear Valley Springs Association regarding the planning, application, operation, and maintenance of per capita grant program project facilities subject to approval as to for, final form by the general manager and the general counsel. Second. I have a motion by Vice President Quinn and a second by Director Jensen. Ms. McEwen. Director Carnan. Aye. Director Grace. Aye. Director Jensen. Aye. Vice President Quinn. Aye. President Hahn. Aye, as well. That motion carries five to zero. Thank you, everyone. Moving on to information and discussion items, board comments. Director Carlin, you are up. I am uh, going to waive comments today. Thank you. Director Grace. I didn't have anything to add specifically on this. Uh, I think I'll have more to say on the, uh, the staff reports. Thank you, sir. Director Jensen. Uh, I have nothing to say right now. Vice President Quinn. No comments. We'll make a five easy ones this time and move on to staff reports, department heads, finance. That's Mr. Jones. Thank you, President Hahn. Uh, the item you have before you is the finance activity report for period three, which is the month of September 2021. Uh, and I stand for any questions you may have. Questions or comments from the public on the finance report, please. No hands. Director Carlin. Nothing, sir. Director Grace. Uh, nothing for me, sir. Director Jensen. I, I think you said no, I'm going to move no, on. No questions, sir. You, sir I, it was muted, that's all. Uh, yeah. do, uh, Vice President Quinn. Uh, no comments, but thank you to Ahmed. <laughs> yeah, for, thank you, Ahmed, for all you do. Um, you're getting off easy tonight. That's good for you. Public <laughs> Works Report, is that done? Uh, I'll, I'll step in at this point to say, uh, Mr. President, members of the board, you have our report and staff is standing by in the event you have any questions. Thank you, sir. I like the report. Uh, moving to the public. Comments from the public? No hands. Director Carlin? Uh, no comments here. Either. Uh, no comments, sir. Director Jensen? Uh, just a question. With the restriping done, uh, I noticed that Fawnway and uh, Pinedale were changed from broken yellows to, to double yellows. I was wondering why that happened and, and what the cost difference is between the two. Um, we actually, there was a lot more that was changed to double yellow. I think um, Lower Valley was the only one that was previously double yellow. Yeah. Okay. I, I only noticed Fawn and, and Pinedale change, so. Yeah. Yeah, we've progressively moved to double yellow center lines. And why, why is that? For um, safer, better visibility. Okay. There, there was no requirement to do that in the, in the MU, uh, MUT 
MUTCD. MUTCD, no, sir. Yeah, no, okay. And what's the cost difference in, in a broken yellow versus a double yellow? Um, I don't have the figures with me. Okay. So I, I can try to get a cost comparison for you. Okay. My, my only concern with like with Fonway and, and the, the half of Pinedale that, that goes through the golf course, I, I drive those roads a lot and I know there's a lot of pedestrian traffic and, and bicycle traffic and people walking dogs and, and walking kids. And I, I know that some people are very rigid when, when they come up on a double yellow line, they're like, I shall not cross over the double yellow line. So they're, they're less likely to, to cheat over to give the pedestrians more room as opposed to when there's a, when there's a broken yellow line. So that's, that's my safety concern about that change. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely don't want to encourage any passing in those areas also. Right. But Lines. if, if there has, has there been a history of that uh, collisions involving unsafe passing on those roads, anything like that? I don't have that information. Okay. That's all. Thank you, sir. Vice President Quinn. Um, <clears throat> question, uh, probably somewhere deep in my memory, I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, the, uh, we may have noticed there's been a goodly amount of fog lately. And uh, <clears throat> I understand, maybe Mr. Uh, the President under, uh, is aware of this, up on the mountain, those, uh, some of those lines are just about uh, invisible even with, uh, without fault. And uh, what is the uh, prospect for places like, for example, Shenandoah or uh, Big Sky or uh, something up on the other side of the valley to um, get fog lines uh, done? Um, we do have a schedule. I, I can't uh, off the top of my head remember when Skyline is due to be restriped, but... Um, it is on a schedule. Okay, will that include the uh, the feeder roads like the, the cul-de-sacs and things like that? The residentials aren't scheduled at the moment. Okay, because they're going to need it, I think. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. President. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Bill. Um, I, I believe we've uh, forwarded that uh, it's called a four-year striping plan um to the board and i was hoping um just given your your questionings that we might display that but i'm not sure i have the proper tools to do that can i display something um i can stop sharing and if you have it you should be able to hit share screen all right, so then uh, I go here and where do I hit the uh, share? Oh, share screen. All right, and then I pick the one I want to do. Just double click on it. Is it showing up now? Yes. All right, so I, I don't recall exactly which one's uh, director. Quinn, you were asking about, but these are the cycles. Um, you'll see um, they've been developed into, you know, fiscal years, which ones uh, for the next uh, 20, it looks like. So these are what has been planned to be done. So I think his first one was, uh, uh, getting our, was it getting arterials or am I confused, Daniel? Maybe you can help explain that. Um, if you scroll up to our fiscal year, that, that just breaks down the arterials and the collectors. Okay. And then here's the map, if that's of help. So okay. if you were looking up here, um, those are intended to be center line and edge lines as opposed to some that are only center lines. Mm -hmm. So 
in in answer to the the question and hopefully so our our residents know as well daniel's done a great job of of laying this out and we now are um, planning to have a regular budget item that will allot the monies to get these things done so uh, in the next four years or maybe three now that we're done with the first one you should see these roads getting restriped either just a center line or a center and a fog line as is i think you call that edge okay all right yeah all right thank you and maybe i um i don't know uh, megan can weigh in um maybe she doesn't need to weigh in but i suspect this document is on the website and if it's not i'll make a note and we'll make it happen and then we also had something i think uh, uh for guardrails uh, is that accurate daniel that was for this fiscal year all right very good so i'll stop sharing now thank you appreciate that mr malinan uh very good uh, let's see that was director that was vice president quinn my comments I, i'm i'm in the camp i'd really like kind of like to know also what the cost difference was be it from a single stripe to double stripe i think that's interesting i predict that it's minimal because most of the cost is probably just running that machine but the, there are material costs with the paint i've noticed the equestrian crossing signs and the uh, street signs and that's good work so i appreciate all that Thank you. Uh, moving on to public safety report, Chief Kermode. Thank you, Mr. President. Do you have before you the report for September? Uh, one clarification I wanted to make is it indicates three mail thefts. I dug into those work for another agency uh, that tied into a local investigation was still underway and the uh, third one was actually identity theft and it was not a mail theft so we've stayed pretty consistent uh, one reported mail theft and, and beyond that i'm happy to answer any questions thank you sir going to the public miss McEwen. Eva? Thank you very much. Um, I had noted earlier that I would like um, them to remove the average response time. I didn't see us speak to it. So I'm hoping that would be, oh, there it is. That's very misleading. So I would hope that would be removed and appreciate that consideration. Uh, secondly, um, can you tell us anything about the cause of the fire? the dome home fire at the end of deer trail and any conditions there that may have, um, cause it's right on the edge of Sycamore Canyon and uh, how far the fire spread, if it started to spread down there and how the firemen were able to address it at all. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I apologize. This was the September report. I didn't uh, prep on the more recent events. Uh, and I was actually out of town. I know that the sergeant reported it to me, uh, although I was out of town and said that it was extinguished, it didn't spread, but I do not know the specific cause of the fire, but I'll find that out for the next report. Thank you, Jiva. Any more hands in the public? There are none. Uh, Director Carlin. Oh, thank you, Chief. Keeping us safe, that's it. Dr. Grace. Uh, yes, Chief, thank you. Uh, I'm sure you'll get a couple more questions about this item from my colleagues, but uh, one of the glaring statistics, I've gotten a lot of comments from the public this week, is the 32 traffic stops and three citations. Uh, and I have to confess, I'm, I'm needing to understand that as well. Can you please, give some explanation as to why we would have 32 stops and only three citations issued. The only thing I can say at this point is that it's always the discretion of the officer whether to issue the citation or not. Uh, I know another board member had asked 
what the violation was on the stops, what was the cause for the stops, but I don't have any direct access to that information. And without pulling uh, radio tapes of each stop, I probably still would not have that information. One of the things that uh, I believe was shared with all the board members was something referring to the RIPA. And uh, that is a mandate that was on larger agencies and it kicks in for our size agencies on January 1. And to keep it simple, uh, it stems from legislation passed relating to racial profiling. So effective January 1 for every traffic stop, every officer initiated encounter with the person in the field, we will have to report to the state the reason for the stop and stop, the perceived ethnicity of the person stopped, the disposition of the stop, general address information, not specific address information of the person stopped, and that all reports to the state of California. Uh, so a side effect of that legislation will be that I will have a report and I would know what each of those 32 traffic stops do, what each of those stops was. And even on the ones where citation came up about an arrest for driving on a suspended license. Well, in that case, the report referred to the unsafe speed by the driver and the officer chose to issue a misdemeanor citation for the suspended license violation and not issue the citation for the speed. So uh, I doubt that the statistics I can obtain from the Sheriff's Department will help clarify that. Uh, the best way to approach it would almost be on a daily basis at this point and try and query the officers as to what the traffic stops were for rather than trying to figure out 32 of them at the end of the month. Um, there are severe limitations uh, with using the sheriff system. I think I've explained to individuals before that uh, when we had our own dispatch and we had our own uh, CAD system, uh, I could log in at any time. I could log in from home. I could see what the current activity was. When I came in in the morning, I could run a 24-hour log that would identify all activity for me. And so basically till the end of the month, when I see there are 32 stops at only three sites, um, don't recognize that there's that huge discrepancy. Um, I can say that one patrol officer and early issue citations to about 25% of the people that I stopped. When I was a traffic officer in Irvine, I was talked to if I was issuing warnings to more than 25% of the people. So the expectation, my expectation, the community's expectation should be that if it is a serious traffic offense, a traffic offense related to safety, the citation should be issued. Best answer I can give you. It's, yeah, and, and I, I hope you appreciate as a, as a lay person, it's just hard to understand why some event would merit a stop and not ultimately merit uh, a citation. And I'll also say anecdotally, we have a tremendous speeding problem in this community and it seems to be getting worse on a weekly basis. So, um, just for a community of 5,000 people, uh, three citations, one every 10 days, that just, uh, I struggle with that. So um, this may be something better discussed with, offline, but um, it's, it's a problem that we need to address, uh, address in the community. So that's more editorial than anything else, but I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that. 
and, and sir, I certainly understand your comments and uh, on the face of it, it does not seem to be an appropriate ratio of stops to citations. Uh, and I will continue to look into it. And if I could just anecdotally again, talk, and, I, and I've, I've worked in Irvine, I worked in Irvine for almost 10 years. So I know the, uh, the tenor of uh, policing in that community. I, I candidly find it hard to believe that there is a limit on, um, you, you, I don't argue with you, but uh, just as a, as a uh, someone operating in that community, um, I also kind of struggle with the idea that we would limit or put a, a maximum on citations, not being in law enforcement and just looking at this, again, anecdotally, um, violations are violations. If 80% if of the people are speeding, we need to be issuing citations to all those folks. So again, I, I apologize for being long-winded and it is, it is um, more editorial on my part, um, but it is a huge problem that is observable on a daily basis for anybody that, that uh, is anywhere adjacent to Bear Valley Road at any, at any time, and that's just one road, um, Lower Valley as well. So, um, so I'll leave it at that, but uh, just needed, needed some better understanding of that. Absolutely agree with you about, about the speed issue. And I see it myself when I'm in a civilian role and what can I say? I, your observation. All right, Chief, you were breaking up on my end a little bit there, but I appreciate, appreciate your comments and uh, thank you for your service. I think he froze. Yep. Okay, I think I'm back. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I, I don't know where I cut off, but I, ultimately what I was saying is I agree with your observation and the speeds do bother me as well as, as a resident. Absolutely. As the police chief. Absolutely, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Director Jensen. Uh, good evening, Chief. Uh, I, Thank you. I, I wanted to start with the, the mail thefts since we're going into the holidays here, uh, we, although we started at three and now we're at one, but I'll, I'll still ask these questions uh, nonetheless. Uh, can you speak to how mail thefts, report, are, mail thefts are reported by the department? I don't understand the question, sir. How, how, how does the department take mail theft reports or are they do you typically dispatch an officer? Do you do them over the phone? Um, uh, typically, we dispatch an officer. The one actual mail theft was an officer dispatched to the home. And the other two cases that included the code section for mail theft, the one that was a, ended up being a courtesy report for another jurisdiction, the officer was sent to the home. And the third one uh, was a much more extensive case. And again, the officer was sent to the home. Okay. And then when, when you do take actual mail theft reports that, that occur in Bear Valley, uh, is there some sort of follow-up that's done with the uh, reporting party sometime after to see, see if they ever got their package or they ever got their mail after the fact? Uh, I can't say that it happens in in every case, uh, you know, again, this month it was only one case. And uh, I believe that uh, Sergeant Hurst would be the one to follow up. When I was here the last time, uh, uh, it was Sergeant Pierce that I had not asked that question. Okay. Um... So you don't know the frequency at which mail gets mail or packages get reported as stolen, and then later they show up and it ends up not being a theft. Very, very rarely. The cases where we have done the follow up, as I was alluding to earlier, we've served, uh, I believe, two search warrants in October based upon a mail theft, and a neighboring agency has also served search warrants in that case. And uh, 
identified uh, fraudulent ID making equipment and such. Uh, I would say it's just an estimate that probably 90% of the time the item is actually stolen or missing. It has not surfaced at the residence. And in this case, the confirmed one for uh, the month of September, it was uh, a large envelope of legal documents and the envelope had been opened and documents were missing from the envelope. Okay. Um, are there any mechanisms that we can put in place to make reporting easier, like maybe an online mail theft report? For we don't have the capabilities of that, but the officers are available to respond. All somebody has to do is make the phone call and the officers will respond and, and take the report. Okay. Um, is there anything preventing, uh, so most of our mailboxes or mailbox stations are adjacent to people's homes. Is there anything preventing a homeowner from placing a security camera on their property that that faces the mailbox station? I, I've always thought that creating partnerships with our, our residents that live next to our mailbox stations and, and having a, a system of security cameras that the police can go and, and review uh, while investigating these, these thefts uh, might be helpful. Uh, is there anything that would prevent a homeowner from doing that? I'm not aware of anything that okay. would prevent a homeowner from uh, focusing a camera onto a public area from their own private property. Okay, I, I would agree with that. Um, and then, you know, hitting on on Director Grace's comments about the three citations. I think one of them was for speed, and then another one was for a expired reg, and another one was for not having proof of insurance. Correct. So I, to, to speak to that, are all of our officers radar trained? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure of the officer that recently transferred from Nevada. I don't know that he's been through a certification course in California. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. When I, when I was working, I was always told I could write as many tickets as I wanted. I didn't have quotas. I could just write as many as I wanted. And uh, I, I think speaking to uh, what Director Grace was saying as, as far as reasons for why this happens, uh, agencies or offices or officers can get caught in this culture of don't do too much because then they'll expect more of, of us. And uh, I, I'd hate to see that happening if, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, to, to clarify one of the points, uh, the expectation in Irvine at the time I was there, uh, both as an officer and, and moving up through the ranks, is that patrol officers were ideally focused on community policing and being in the neighborhoods. Traffic officers were expected to be on their beats. I mean, for, for a month, I was assigned to a one mile section of public. Yes, believe it, right? As many as I wanted. But when you're looking at the overall performance of a community police officer and uh, making citizen contacts and uh, patrolling in the neighborhoods for burglaries and those types of things, if an officer had an inordinate number of citations as a patrol officer, that would indicate that he wasn't spending sufficient time on the other community-oriented policing activities. So here in Bear Valley, there is certainly time for both. And I know I personally have seen the officers working 
radar near the equestrian center, working radar near the gas station, working radar on the, uh, the Cumberland Hill, uh, working radar in other locations. So it comes back to the question of why the ratio that's way, way out of whack. And I certainly haven't seen it as something where, where they don't want to be doing the work. Um, uh, not that it factors into the officer's decisions, but it is kind of interesting that as a CSD, uh, it potentially can cost us more for writing the citation than, uh, uh, I guess to put it a different way, a CSD doesn't receive back any of the revenue from the traffic fines or the penalty assessments like a city does. So we can actually be deeply in the hole if uh, a citation is challenged and the officer has to go then to court either on their time off or if we have to bring another officer to fill in behind that officer, uh, it just digs a hole. And that's a budget issue. That's not an enforcement issue. And the officers uh, through Sergeant Hurst uh, have been told. I know that uh, two months ago when the citations were lower, uh, Sergeant Hurst talked with the officers and the next month uh, they actively worked the school buses and generated several more moving citations. So I don't have an answer as to why the ratio is out of whack, but it's something I'll be talking to my staff about. Well, I, I mean, you bring up an interesting point there. I, I, I don't know what price you put on traffic safety. I mean, ultimately you write tickets, people go to court, they make overtime, you have to backfill. I mean, that's just, that's just the cost of doing business, you know, with, with this type of work, but it, it seems like, you know, our, our strategy here is uh, giving residents warnings, uh, you know, just to promote goodwill for the department rather than, you know, promoting traffic safety. And I, I certainly hate to see that happening. Well, with all respect, sir, that's your assumption of what's happening. And uh, I know that the uh, last time I, I was here, there was a very strong anti-traffic uh, enforcement culture in there but either as a result of new, new or a result of uh, things being too lax in the past, the sure price on safety enforcement, I just thought it was an interesting note. And it's not something that we talk to the officers about. It's, it's a budgetary issue and just to ensure that we have appropriate those vacancies when we have to. I would never discourage an officer from writing a citation because the amount of uh, overtime it might cost us. Not at all. Like you said, I traffic wasn't my career, but I, I did it prior to making sergeant. And you know there were high expectations for that particular activity because that was my only job. And. Uh, there is time here for officers to balance the community policing activities with the traffic enforcement. Uh, I know that only two uh, and we've been getting the bids on either two this year, but we have two and generally there's no more than two officers out working the field at the time. And I know one of the steps that Sergeant Hurst had taken was to adjust the hours so that in the early, when traffic starting to flow back in, that we have a higher visibility and a higher presence. So said, I have to dig in as to why the show is so different, but I'm not gonna any assumptions without the facts. I, I understood most of that. Thank you. I froze up again. That's Anything right. else, sir? 
All right, thank you. No. Uh, Vice President Quinn. I have nothing, thank you. Right, uh, thank you, Chief, and thanks to all your officers for your service to the community. Uh, General Counsel report is next. Oh, um, no, yeah, General Counsel report, please. Thank you, President. Um, no report this evening, thank you. Right, <clears throat> so is there any hands raised by the public, Christy? Any board comments for this, uh, Director Carlin? No. Questions, Director Jensen? Or no, sir. Director Jensen? No, sir. Uh, Vice President Quinn? No. I've got nothing. Uh, General Manager report, Mr. Malinen. Mr. President, members of the board, uh, first item is the tree grant project update. The uh, contractor, Arrowhead Enterprises, is back after about a three month hiatus. Um, they are in task area five of nine. We're about halfway through and we have a plan to bring the logs down off of the mountain um, and have them chipped up at the uh, wastewater treatment plant property where we will spread them. Uh, so there will be no logs going out the front door or the back door. And we will also spread them where we can around our CSD property. So I'm excited about the, the potential for that uh, to spruce things up. And I, uh, in reflecting on it, think it's a pretty good solution in that the residents, all of them, uh, will benefit by the beautification of our properties. The uh, item I mentioned about the water system RFP, I expect that, that will go back to our infrastructure committee in December um, and uh, you know, we'll make comments and work with Mr. Paparella. He is the, the resident expert. The discussion about the gate and, and Director Jensen had shared with me uh, some of the email correspondence he'd had with the county and I want the board to understand I was not aware of a roundabout plan. They are making an application for a grant to fund the right-of-way acquisition down at that intersection and the project. So I've uh, I've been in touch with um, Supervisor Scrivener to let him know that we did not have any information about this project, and I think we should as a community. Uh, I've then talked to the various levels at uh, Kern Public Works to uh, have these conversations and get information for you and for our public about that project. Um, can I get a, a sh share screen capability there, Christy, for a moment? Sure. All righty. Thank you. Let's see if I can do. This. So uh, just to show everybody and uh, leave this on for a couple of seconds anyway. This is how you get to those unique and special uh, vintage street name signs. And, and when you do go there, just a moment, I'm gonna, uh, show another one, it's gonna look like this. And look at this. We have people already in the $100 range uh, bidding on signs. So we're quite optimistic that uh, this will be good for our people. They'll have some fun with it and it'll benefit their CSD. Um, we are uh, closed on our police chief recruitment. Uh, as of Friday, we've got, I believe it was seven. And so we're finalizing the process that will involve uh, the community, uh, peers, our staff, and our board. And the uh, BVSA has uh, indicated they're ready to proceed with at least a test of the amenity card RFID project. So uh, the ball will now come back to our court to install the readers that will be needed. And then uh, we'll do a 30-day trial or something before they begin to go in mass 
uh, with their amenity card program. Um, we're doing a little bit more work on our wastewater permit. Um, we do have to get what's called the Title 22 report. It's the Clean Water Act um, that relates to our effluent. And uh, so we're going to be doing some of that, and that, that will require a little outside work. We asked if we might be able to uh, do it ourselves, but it takes uh, an engineer uh, an engineer stamp, so unfortunately. Um, uh, just FYI, we are closed tomorrow for Veterans Day, the 11th, and then uh, in conclusion, we won't see you all, so wish you all a, a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, Ms. McEwen, are there any hands up? Yes. One second here. Jiva? Hello, thank you. Thank you for that report, Dale. Um, I noticed the last meeting, um, and maybe it was on an infrastructure, I forget when, you had mentioned that the community may not have access to the chips. So if you could clarify that. And then the second thing I'd like to ask about, and I had mentioned earlier, is is the staff, the road staff, going to go and note, take note of the road conditions from Medicine Boat down Deer Trail all the way down to uh, the waste plant where they're gonna be doing the, um, using the tub grinder to chip everything? of road conditions, because that's been a real concern for everybody as in the past. Um, I don't know that it's gonna be an issue or not, but I just, as I said before, would like to make sure conditions were noted before and then the heavy use of bringing down, um, I don't know how many acre feet um, I was talking, and it was quite a bit, thousands of, or linear feet of um, logs that they're gonna be bringing down. So I was wondering if you were going to follow up on that to, so we would avoid any issues or complaints from people if the roads were the same condition as prior to when they started bringing the logs down. Thank you. Okay, there are no more hands. Okay, uh, Bill? Just Fox? curious, Mr. Yeah. President. Um, so, in reverse order, uh, yes, we're going to be doing that, and we've already talked about it, so it's a good idea. We'll we'll take a look at conditions, and then secondly, um, I think our our plan really precludes uh, chips for the public. So I thought it was a good idea. I now think this is a better idea, and uh, we're not going to uh, have to do whatever logistical issues to try to accommodate people getting wood chips because. Uh, I believe between the CSD and the association, uh, those chips will get used. And when we do it that way, everybody benefits. So that's why I like that approach. Director Carlin, general manager report. Nothing. Director Grace. Nothing for me, sir. Director Jensen. Uh, nothing, sir. Vice President Quinn. I have nothing. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, I agree. He talked long enough, didn't he? Uh, future agenda items, uh, Ms. McEwen. I think we just have what is listed on the agenda, and I did not have any additions during this meeting. I don't recall any either. That brings us to adjournment. So I'll echo Bill already mentioned Veterans Day. So uh, to all those who serve past and present, thank you for your service to our nation. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I, that I'm sure every all of my colleagues on the board feel the same way about those two comments, but I Indeed. really speak for everyone. Thank you, veterans. Yes, yes sir. Uh, 8 to 12 p.m. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank Have a you. great night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, all.